Welcome to Water Sessions, a Water Council podcast. Mention any risk anywhere in the world and you'll find a connection to water. We explore water challenges and the future of water innovation with experts in the water community, sharing stories and perspectives that you won't hear anywhere else. A special thanks to our series sponsor, RexNord, a global leader of advanced water management solutions and smart technologies. RexNord solves smarter for its customers to deliver hygienic, safe, and efficient products that protect human health and the environment. Additional support is provided by the Fund for Lake Michigan. And now, the host of today's Water Session, Matt Howard. Welcome to another episode of Water Sessions, a Water Council podcast. My name is Matt Howard. I'm the Vice President for Water Stewardship at the Water Council. And today we'll be discussing water stewardship and redevelopment in Milwaukee's Inner Harbor. I'm thrilled to be joined by two of our area's leaders in these fields, Vicki Elkin at the Fund for Lake Michigan and Lilith Fowler at the Harbor District. And so maybe for each of you, I'll just have you do a quick introduction just in terms of who you are, but what does your organization do and why are you focused or concerned about what's happening in the Inner Harbor area of Milwaukee and specifically both the tributaries and the lake itself in terms of Lake Michigan and the water resources there. So we'll start with you, Vicki. Why don't you just give us a brief intro? Sure. Thank you, Matt. Like Matt said, my name is Vicki Elkin, and I'm the executive director of an organization called the Fund for Lake Michigan. And we are a private foundation based in Milwaukee. And as our name would suggest, our mission is to improve water quality in Lake Michigan. Now, I'm sure most of your listeners realize that Lake Michigan is very big and it's a very complicated system. So our efforts are really focused on improving water quality more locally on the western shore of Lake Michigan. So our projects range from large restoration projects like wetland restoration or dam removals, but we're also very involved in addressing water pollution in urban areas and in restoring habitat in urban areas. So As I'm sure you know, historically, a lot of people have lived along the lake for transportation and other reasons. And this is where our most of our population or a big portion of it continues to live. So that means both there is this legacy of contamination and pollution, but at the same time, an opportunity to improve water quality for the people who live here. So I think it's now like close to 50 million people depend on the lakes for their drinking water. Obviously, we have an invested interest in keeping that water clean, but it's also important for our economy and tourism and recreation. So we just had a lot of opportunities to work with great partners like the Water Council and Harbor District to improve water quality in the tributaries and right along Lake Michigan. Thanks, Vicki. One point that I want to pull in a little bit later in our conversation that you mentioned is this idea of addressing water quality in Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes. And as I'm sure you both know, we'll have listeners from all over the U.S. and and North America. And it may not be so obvious to them when we've got a city like Milwaukee that sits on 20 percent of the world's freshwater reserves that we actually have some serious water stresses related to quality that we have to address. And so I just want to hold that point there, and we'll get back to it when we start talking about some of our specific work in the Inner Harbor together. So thanks, Vicki. Lilith, you're next. Tell us a little bit about yourself in the Harbor District. Great. Thank you. So my name is Lilith Fowler, and I'm the executive director of a small Milwaukee-based nonprofit organization called Harbor District, Inc. We also have a business improvement district that we're affiliated with. So between these two organizations, We really are focusing on the revitalization of the land and the water at the heart of the city of Milwaukee around the Inner Harbor. And the effort started about a decade ago with some planning at the city of Milwaukee and the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's decision to create a new school of freshwater sciences in the Inner Harbor, which really just opened people's eyes, I think, in a new way to the potential of a really industrial waterfront that has a lot of assets, but a lot of challenges. So as we started working in this area, the first thing you do is catalog, like what are the assets and what are the challenges? And the water really falls in both categories, right? Everyone who looks at the place recognizes how special it is to be right on the waterfront with unimpeded access to Lake Michigan and recreational opportunities 
commercial shipping opportunities, all kinds of wonderful things that come with that waterfront. And at the same time, there are flooding challenges. There are, as you mentioned, water quality challenges. We get stories from stakeholders who live in the surrounding neighborhood who tell us about how their grandparents who grew up down here used to come down and swim in the Inner Harbor every morning. So that's definitely something that's not happening on a regular basis anymore. You know, and as we think about ways that we would reconnect people to the waterfront here and stitch this land back into the community of Milwaukee, uses like fishing and swimming and boating are things that we want to be safe. We'd like to be able to tell people that they can eat the fish that they catch. So it has really tremendous possibilities for us and so much to offer and yet really some challenges that we need to work through. Thanks, Lilith. I One of the themes that I want to pick up from your introduction as well, too, is this idea that the Inner Harbor really is the heart of Milwaukee. And in many ways, it was the birthplace of Milwaukee, one of the founding sort of neighborhoods within the city, but also the birthplace of manufacturing innovation as well, too. A lot of the sort of the household manufacturing names had machine shops and little shacks in Walker's Point near the Inner Harbor, where they really began to develop their areas of expertise and their products that people know and love from Milwaukee. And in a way, now I kind of want to move into, well, let's set the scene a little bit about the Inner Harbor. And you've sort of alluded to some of this already, Lilith, in in terms of your overview. But we've got a very old historical part of the city of Milwaukee that really is literally is a confluence of the north side, the south side, you know, the West in terms of the city of Milwaukee, the east side, but the confluence of our rivers going into the harbor itself and out into the lake. Was this area overlooked? What kind of brought you here as the harbor district to start? It seems like such an obvious spot to really focus development on, but it seems like maybe it was forgotten a little bit or overlooked. I'm just, how do we get to this point where we need a harbor district? I think it was loved a little too hard for for too long. <laughs> And I think it was used a little too hard for too long. So it was such an attractive location as Milwaukee was just starting out. There were all kinds of shipping activity that happened there. We were actually the busiest port in the world in the 1850s as lumber and grain that came from the plain states was shipped out from Milwaukee all over the world. And Milwaukee listeners will remember those great posters with Milwaukee as the breadbasket to the world and the machine shop to the world and all those great things. That was all happening in the Harbor District. So right through probably 1960, it was just really a hive of activity all the time. And those activities became more and more extractive in terms of the way that they treated the land over time. And then eventually, we had the Clean Water Act, we had new environmental regulations, some businesses that had really been successful here, tanneries, and some of the industries that Milwaukee really was founded on, moved, frankly, out of the United States to places where they could continue to do business without facing the kinds of environmental regulations that they were going to be subject to here. So we saw tanneries and foundries and lots of those big industries closing down and moving away. And what they left behind was such a legacy of contamination. There were a couple of challenges there. One is just that in the 80s, as we were beginning to get our hands around, what is that and what do we need to do about it and how do we deal with it? People really didn't know, we didn't have the standard go-to environmental cleanup protocols that we do now. So we're better at doing this stuff now. And so that gives us both a little more confidence in terms of taking on a site that has a lot of environmental contamination and it's less expensive. So it's less risky and it's relatively speaking, less costly because you're not making it up from scratch. So really what happened was we had a place, everybody knew it was great. And for as long as I've lived in Milwaukee, which is 22 years now, people have been looking at, there's a few sites down there that different developers have always had their eye on and been proposing condos and Olympic villages and Ferris wheels. But nobody was really able to figure out how to make it go until just recently. And specifically, I cited the UWM School of Freshwater Sciences as something that 
started to tip the balance in terms of how attractive the place was and the market value. So as the cost and the risk of the environmental cleanup are sort of getting less scary, the land was also becoming more valuable, more attractive. And so sometime in the last, say, five to 10 years, those two lines started to cross to a point where we could say like, wow, let's make something happen here. Yeah, it's a great story. And to me, it really reminds me of a true concept of sustainability because we're really talking about economic engine in terms of the growth of Milwaukee. There's also the environmental issue. Obviously, we're talking about water resources today, and we're going to get into water quality and some of the challenges with stormwater runoff and whatnot that's being faced out in the region. But then again, you, you sort of mentioned the elders who were swimming in the lake. So this socially important aspect of being close to the lake to recreate into the lake and just really have it be a part of people's lives and neighborhoods where they work. And you've got a bit of personal background in sustainable redevelopment. And I want to talk about some of that too in a minute. I want to pivot back over to Vicki because part of what makes the Harbor District unique And I think really the way we do things in Milwaukee makes it unique. Again, is we're focusing on the water resource, but we just don't look at it as just a resource or an input that we can move around and use and discard. We really look at it as an asset. And we tend to take more of a stewardship approach to this particular asset, to our freshwater resources. From your point of view at the Fund for Lake Michigan, some of the issues that we're seeing here in the Inner Harbor and in the Harbor District are replicated, you know, all over Lake Michigan and across the Great Lakes. What is your specific area of focus when it comes to a more urbanized redevelopment or effort? Because a lot of times when we think of habitat restoration, improving water resources, it's happening way out in rural areas and headwater areas. But here we're really, I mean, it's the confluence, again, back to that term, the confluence of activity, environmental activity, et cetera, in, in Milwaukee. Is that an attractor for the Fund for Lake Michigan to really be able to focus work in an urban environment like this? Or does it not really matter? It's just about where the need is. Actually, I think it's really exciting to focus our work on urban areas. And a couple things that I'm especially excited about we're trying to really build on the momentum and the interest that individuals have in making a difference. So as you both have said, water is really, really important to the identity of people in the region. And I think that's probably true to anyone that lives near one of the Great Lakes. It's almost like a spiritual connection for those of us who've had the opportunity to enjoy it, live near the lakes, and really experience them. So that translates into people wanting to make a difference themselves. So you've mentioned runoff as a source of pollution in urban areas. And I think most people are familiar with that concept, but basically the idea is as rainwater washes across paved surfaces, such as driveways or roads, or even rooftops, it carries with it pollution to our waterways. And thanks to the Clean Water Act, we've really learned how to deal with pollution that comes from a pipe And it's much harder to address this dispersed source of water pollution. So for us, empowering individuals and local businesses and local communities to address their own runoff is really powerful. So the way that we see that is through funding something called green infrastructure, which might start with a rain barrel and then a rain garden. And it's a way to get people invested and interested. And once you start doing something yourself, it's much easier to push your local government or your employer to do something. And then you said when it comes to things like habitat restoration, it's always happening someplace else, someplace more natural, more pristine, more rural. But as you know, everything is connected. And that is especially true when it comes to water. So for example, in Southeast Wisconsin, you actually have some fairly decent upstream habitat. And fish, God love them, you know, try to get to it. And in order to go from Lake Michigan, you have to make your way across a very scary environment for a small fish, and that would be the Inner Harbor. So one of the things that we're focusing on with the Harbor District and other partners, including the School of Freshwater Sciences at UW-Milwaukee, is building and improving habitat in a very urbanized environment under the surface of the water so that fish have basically rest stops to rest at as they're trying to make their way upstream. Another project that 
I'm especially excited about is an effort. It's a 25 year effort to reintroduce lake sturgeon to the Milwaukee River watershed. I think we're in about year 15 a partnership. I have to mention with River Edge Nature Center and the Wisconsin DNR. So they rear sturgeon far up the Milwaukee River using Milwaukee River water. The water chemically imprints on these fish that are then released into Lake Michigan and will come back eventually to reproduce in the Milwaukee River watershed. So we're already seeing those fish come back, which is a real sign of habitat improvements, water quality improvements, and the fact that they're able to navigate their way through the inner harbor. I'm just going to piggyback on what Vicki was saying and also respond to your question, Matt, about looking at what we can do in urban environments versus those wonderful, pristine upstream environments. And part of the way that I approach the work of Harbor District is to say 100, 120 years of development in the Harbor District left us in the late 80s with liabilities, basically, right? And now we're at this moment of not a completely clean slate, but a huge reset and huge new envelopment and investment in the area. And it seems like we should figure out how to do that in a way that what we end up with 120 years from now is assets instead of liabilities. So we need to be more thoughtful and more creative and more intentional about how we're going to use the place. And part of that is setting an expectation that this is not a throwaway place. And there's no aspect of it that is throwaway. All of it is valuable and all kinds of things can thrive here. And all the spaces and the waterways can have these, fill these multiple functions as long as we don't let one function spoil it for all the others. So really conveying an ethic of maintaining a functional ecosystem as part of the work that we do or rebuilding that function back into the space. I think is really important and really sets the stage for lots of other things that we'd like to do better this time around. So I want to pick up this concept of stewardship because basically what you've both described and and certainly Lilith with your most recent points is that we need to take a longer term sort of that seven generations approach to not only redevelopment, but development in general. And so one of these ideas that I kind of tossed out to both of you a couple of years ago relates to a nonprofit that we work with at the Water Council called the Alliance for Water Stewardship, which is an international NGO based in the UK. And essentially what they do is is they have a, a standard, a voluntary standard for how sites essentially steward water resources within the site, but also to ensure that how those sites operate, that they don't have a broader negative impact on, on the surrounding watershed. And so it's become a very popular standard in food and beverage, consumer products, some other industries, and very large companies using this standard. And one of the things that we do at the Water Council on behalf of the Alliance for Water Stewardship is we essentially oversee the use of the standard and the system in North America for them. So one of the things that we were seeing sort of globally with the use of the Alliance for Water Stewardship standard was, again, it was kind of focused more at large industrial scale factories. And one of the things that makes the Walker's Point neighborhood and the Inner Harbor area of Milwaukee so unique is a lot of the small businesses. And I kind of alluded to in my intro that many of the key names with Milwaukee, Johnson Controls, Harnischweg, or some others, you know, all got their start down there in Walker's Point in small manufacturing shops. Those shops still exist today by different names. Some of them are generational and family owned. Some of them are subsidiaries of larger corporations. And one of the ideas that I brought to the two of you is, can we leverage investments that Vicky and the fund have already been making in the region? Can we leverage all the great work that Lilith and the Harbor District have already been doing in the Inner Harbor to really create a, a water stewardship ethic for the businesses that operate down there as well? And for me, it's always one of the missing pieces when it comes to sustainability or the environment is how do we get the private sector to participate? And when it comes to our water resources, you know, we all have a stake in it. We all get our drinking water from Lake Michigan. We all return our wastewater through the treatment facility back to the lake. So how can we sort of create a self-perpetuating water stewardship district down in the Inner Harbor region of Milwaukee? 
And so the Fund for Lake Michigan was very gracious over the past four years to award a, a couple of grants to the Water Council and the Alliance for Water Stewardship to undertake some of this work, which has been mostly focused recently on smaller manufacturers. And in fact, we just worked with Alimentus and Ingle Forge, two really small manufacturers. Probably each one of those has less than 20 employees or somewhere around 20 employees. So really small manufacturers. One is located right on the Inner Harbor. The other one's located in a very old neighborhood in Milwaukee, right in the middle of the neighborhood. They've been an asset for that neighborhood for a generation. And ultimately, they've both been certified to this standard and have become the first small businesses on the planet to achieve that certification. So a really big deal. We at the Water Council would never have found out about those businesses were it not for all the work and the groundwork that Lilith has done. And she really and her team made introductions to both of those sites. And of course, again, the funding for Vicky and sort of trusting in this vision to do this work down there really helped bring this all together. Part of what we hope to accomplish with these Water Sessions podcasts is some shareable best practices and learnings with our colleagues across the Great Lakes or in other regions of the United States or North America. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is oftentimes in the nonprofit world, solutions like parachute in from the sky out of the blue. And sometimes that can work at cross purposes with efforts that were already underway on the ground for many years. And so for me, one of the takeaways was really leveraging and working with, again, efforts and organizations that already had credibility and already had done a lot of the hard work to sort of pave the way for kind of an add on effort like this. Is that just in terms of the work that you continue to do, both Vicky across the state and across the basin and, and Lilith within the Harbor District, that lesson of really kind of pulling in other water-related stakeholders. I mean, it's key, right, to success. I mean, individual water-related stakeholders cannot address these issues on their own. They just simply by nature of, of water and uh, how complex the issues are, we need to work together. Right. I mean, this is kind of a, a simple takeaway. I would say absolutely. Of course, it works better to work together and no one, particularly at the scale of a small local business, they're not going to have an impact that can be felt at the scale of Lake Michigan. Right. So that in and of itself says, yes, you've got to be working in concert with someone else. But then just purely sort of on the logistics side of it, for me as the on the ground partner, I can offer certain things in terms of knowledge of who's out there and who would be a good introduction for you. And then you offered everything else, right? So the AWS and the Water Council came in and did the project once I made the introduction. So that was really, in my mind, you guys did what you do best and I did what I do best and it worked fantastic. And Vicky did what she does best, which is write us a check to make something <laughs> happen. <laughs> special skill set I've developed over the years. <laughs> One thing that you said was you described those businesses as water stakeholders. And I think that they would not have thought of themselves that way before this project, but they surely do now, right? And so I think that's a really valuable outcome just in and of itself. The other thing is I think most organizations like Harbor District that are engaged in redevelopment of an industrial district think of themselves as economic development corporations. So I will say that I think a lot of groups could look more broadly at their place and what it needs and what it offers and figure out ways to define the environment and the ecology of the place as part of their brief, as part of what they do. And you give yourself a lot more opportunities and ways to engage with your different stakeholders, if suddenly you can say to them, well, you're actually a water stakeholder too, and you're an energy stakeholder, and you're a bird stakeholder or a whatever. And different businesses respond to different things. But it's always surprising to me to go in and talk to a business that you would think wouldn't have the slightest interest in some of these topics, you know, a cement terminal that we go in and we say, hey, we're trying to build public access and river walk all along this riverfront. And they're like, huh, you know, we could probably figure out how to work with that. Now, getting into the details of it gets more complicated, but a lot of places are a lot more open to the conversation than I think we give them credit for. 
Well, I think we tend to forget, too, that they have employees and those employees live in these neighborhoods and live in this community. And they they like to fish. They like to kayak. You know, they like our parks. And I think, you know, as a best practice in the sustainability world, always engage your employees. They're closest to the issues. And again, they're, they're living in the neighborhoods. Vicki, as, as you look at, I guess what you would say, sort of a traditional project, maybe that the fund for Lake Michigan typically invests in. Do you usually see projects like this where the focus is more on private sector practices and hopefully having some impact as well on land that private sector organization owns as being a positive contributing factor to improving water quality or or whatever the specific water related issue is? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I guess what I would say is while we are focused on projects where we see near term measurable results, We're also interested in systemic solutions. So we don't want to just spend time restoring and compensating for our past mistakes. We want to change practices so that going forward, we have improved water quality and we're better stewards of our water resources. And one thing I would say relative to what you said earlier, Matt, is It seems crazy to say this because I think anyone that's seen a chart about the water cycle knows that all water gets recycled. But I think we're just now coming to a point where people really understand that. So the salt that comes into the Inner Harbor to put on our roads to help manage ice in the winter actually ends up back in the water. Like that that is where it goes. And we're not making water. We can't make water. We can only use the water that we have. And so I think there is some growing awareness about that, thanks in part to some unfortunate events over the past five to 10 years, such as the drinking water crisis in Flint, PFAS contamination of drinking wells. People are more aware of where their water comes from how vulnerable it is and how it impacts their lives directly. And so with regard to the Alliance for Water Stewardship standard, I really think it has tremendous potential. I know that only a handful of sites at this point in North America have adopted it. But in my mind, it could become as popular as LEED certification for buildings as we continue to have this growing awareness about water. I'm an optimist on the Alliance for Water Stewardship in the standard. But I think, unfortunately, because of COVID, it's been a trend accelerator in certain regards. And I think certainly looking at like the food and beverage sector and how that was stressed at the beginning of the outbreak here in North America, a lot of those companies really valued the resiliency of their supply chains and the fact that many of them did not have to worry too much about water security issues. And certainly from a drinking water and wastewater treatment perspective, we figured out how to operate these utilities essentially online without full staff people in place. And so I think coming out of this pandemic, I think we're going to see a redoubling of efforts across the board just in ensuring that we have secure, sustainable sources of water not just for businesses, but obviously for people in nature as well, too. And so I think that ties into another story that I like to tell about Milwaukee and the communities around Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes, which is, again, just because we have access to 20% of the world's freshwater resources, doesn't mean we can just sit by and just kind of coast on our quantity of water that we have available. In fact, even though we have so much water, we tend to spend a lot more time focusing on the sustainability of that water resources. Now, we've got some serious issues in terms of water quality, but I think people are somewhat surprised within kind of the water profession in North America or globally when they see Great Lakes cities or states kind of leading on water stewardship issues. With that frame of reference, I want to dive back down to the Harbor District and this idea of getting small businesses, just different types of water users, as I call them, water stakeholders involved in the stewardship approach to managing their water through the Alliance for Water Stewardship. The vision for the Harbor District, Lilith, is somewhat unique in that a lot of the focus of the redevelopment, again, is on that natural resource, right? And you really sort of hone this approach through some of the previous work that you've done in the Milwaukee region, specifically kind of going a little bit further west in the Menominee Valley, the Menominee River, for those people who aren't familiar with the geography flows, 
into the Inner Harbor area and out into Lake Michigan and, and downtown. And stormwater and sustainability guidelines and things of that nature were really kind of the heart and soul of the redevelopment effort in the Menominee Valley. And you learn some things from that redevelopment and hopefully, and I know you are, applying those in, in the Harbor District. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about kind of some of the lessons, the environmental lessons from the Menominee Valley that are being applied to the water resource in the Inner Harbor. Sure. So I was the executive director of a very similar organization to Harbor District called Menominee Valley Partners about 20, 15 to 20 years ago. And the Menominee Valley was also in certain ways a very similar type of space when I started working there in the sense that it was characterized by a lot of big and very dirty brownfield sites and a river and the opportunity to provide jobs and new manufacturing or industrial-based economic development for the city. And in a way, sustainable development became a way to brand that effort and to distinguish it from other places that somebody could choose to locate a business. So there were certainly going to be sites that would be easier to develop and cheaper to develop if you were looking to locate a light industrial building somewhere. And the Milwaukee suburbs are sort of ringed with much less expensive industrial developments than the Menominee Valley. So we had to figure out what's our competitive edge here, right? How do we distinguish ourselves? What can we do that's different? And the interesting thing about choosing that kind of a brand, so to speak, for your place is that you also then end up attracting the people who are or the people of the companies who are willing to make investments for the long haul in the place where they locate. So we spent time and effort in thinking about not just how you clean up the brownfields, but how do you do that in a way that really sets those spaces up to be, again, ecologically functional for the future in a way that will be beneficial to the companies around them. So we looked at things like shared stormwater management that provides a benefit to a company and lets them use more of their site footprint than they might otherwise have. Strategies like that, bike trails and river restoration and other park-like amenities, which, as you said, people's employees also want to have a nice place to be. It is not a detriment if you are in a competitive workforce market and trying to hire people to be able to say, yes, on your lunch break, you can go for a mile walk along the river on the Hank Aaron State bike trail and count the butterflies or help maintain the native flowers. So two great things came out of that. One was that we saw it was a pretty successful strategy for that place. And two was that Milwaukee, which is just an incredibly skeptical community, saw that we could actually do it. So we were able to take a lot of that learning to the Harbor District and just start with that in mind. And, you know, knowing that some tools are going to work better in some places than others. For the Menominee Valley, we developed sustainable design guidelines. And I think those have been tricky and complicated as you dig into, you know, a topic like that. And there's a state energy building code that we're not going to try to write again for a small number of developments in the Menominee Valley, right? So there's a lot of other things that you end up referring to when you try to do something like that. But we were able to say like, hey, let's focus in this very specific and place-based way on these specific place-based issues and opportunities and call those out for people. So we're trying to do that again in the Harbor District. And I think to an even greater extent in the harbor. It's just obvious how much water is the centerpiece of what we're doing. Lilith, can you talk a little bit about the land and water use plan or land use and water plan for the Harbor District? We created a water and land use plan, which has the fabulous acronym of WALLOP. So typically the way that the city of Milwaukee and other cities manage planning is they have a comprehensive plan that covers what you're going to do where in different parts of your city. Where are you going to have your used car lots? Where are you going to have your elementary schools? So when we started working in the Harbor District, there were several different plans that covered different parts of the area. And we felt like part of what was going to be important here was to define this space 
as something that's not just the edges of a bunch of different neighborhoods, but as a district in and of itself with water at its center. So we started with that notion, and then it became obvious that we wanted to think not just about the land use, but also the water use. So we have the water and land use plan. And that really looks at land uses for several sub-districts, including our waterways. So we created the waterways as a district, and we said, what do we want to have happen here? We want recreation. We want that to happen. We want commercial shipping to continue because that's a valuable part of Milwaukee's economy. And we actually started to bake into that some of the sustainability aspects that we had looked at in the Menominee Valley as well. So thinking about public access, thinking about native landscaping, thinking about on-site stormwater management, and just in very broad brushstrokes, sort of giving people the idea that those were things that we were going to want to consider in the redevelopment of each site in this place. So one of the things that's really exciting to me about the Harbor District and really in general, the work that both of you do, and again, water-related work, is the fact that we get to work with all different types of stakeholders. And so I've already talked a little bit about two of the small businesses that we kind of introduced to this world of water stewardship, Elementus and and Ingle Forge. We've got a commercial office building down here, part of another grant that Vicki supported called the Global Water Center, which is where the Water Council and the Alliance for Water Stewardship North America headquarters are located. That happens to be the first commercial office building in the world certified to the AWS standard. Interesting note to our listeners, the second commercial office building in the world to be certified to the AWS standard was just announced a couple months ago as Google's world headquarters, so the Googleplex. So Vicki, your investment in the Global Water Center's certification served as a model for the Googleplex. I think the work that's happening here in Milwaukee focused, again, as as Lilith has just described, on water as an asset and water as a critical or central component to a redevelopment really is a model for other regions and, and for other places in North America and globally. And so one of those key stakeholders that I think we need to just spend a little bit more time on, even if it's brief, and they've been mentioned a couple of times already, is the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences, kind of the uh, first of its kind graduate level program and an area of study in the United States, physically located right on the edge of the water. They have a research vessel which goes out in, into Lake Michigan, but a you know a highly respected program. And, and I think one of the things that individuals at the university are always looking to do is, is how can we have an impact in the real world and how can we connect with our neighbors and with our community on work that's important to us. And I know that's one of the things that Vicki, through the fund that you've sort of been encouraging at the School of Freshwater Sciences is really kind of translating some of that knowledge and getting it out into the community, plugging into what the Harbor District is doing. We've even been able to utilize some of the experts at the School of Freshwater Sciences to help support work of the Alliance for Water Stewardship. How important is it to have universities involved in this stuff? Well, I think it's extremely important, especially when you're talking about new approaches, new technologies, new systems. You know, those have to be proven before they're adopted. And I do think there is a lot of creativity coming out of the university. And there are certainly a number of professors who are interested in having their research result in real world change. So I think that they've been a great partner to us, and it's great that they're here. So one of the projects we've been involved with the School of Freshwater Sciences is an innovative effort to map habitat in the inner and outer harbor using all sorts of technology that I could not begin to describe, but a combination of cutting-edge technology and underwater diving and side-scan sonar to really understand how fish and other critters in the water are adapting to very urbanized landscape. And as I mentioned earlier, fish need to figure out a way to cross this area so that they can get into their upstream habitat. And what the scientists and graduate students who are working on the project found is that fish were making a habitat or finding habitat in some really unique spots, breaks in the break wall, in between the rocks, in the breakwater cars that have been submerged in the water. So that led to a plan to enhance those spots, but then also create additional rest routes, if you will, to connect those 
biological hotspots to other biological hotspots. Again, so the fish have these little oases under the water. But one of the more exciting things to come out of that is that we've been in conversations with the Army Corps that when they are out fixing breakwater, breakwaters as part of their routine maintenance, that they think about using smaller rock or different shapes of rock or different angles of rock when they are doing their work that are more fish friendly. So I don't know if anyone out there has ever worked with the Army Corps, but they kind of operate in decades instead of years. And we've really come far in those conversations, which to me is really, really exciting because again, it's an opportunity to have some systemic change. And if we can make our infrastructure, whether it's above ground or below water, more sustainable, more ecologically friendly, then I think that's a big win for everyone. So now we've taken that model from the Milwaukee Harbor and are doing a similar process in four harbors up the coastline in Port Washington, Sheboygan, Two Rivers, and Manitowoc. Again, it's something that had never been done before and is having an impact in the real world. Thanks, Vicki, for that. I, I think just kind of looking at time here, we probably want to try and sort of bring our concluding points to bear here. But before I turn it over to the two of you to offer some concluding thoughts on our conversation, it might be helpful just to sort of recap where we've been. It's It's been uh, somewhat meandering like the Menominee River in terms of our conversation. But Really looking at this idea of having an impact on a place, we know that water, water stress, water risk issues are hyper-local. We also know because of their complexity and difficulty of addressing those water-related issues that we need to get involved all different types of stakeholders. We've talked about a university, we've talked about the Army Corps, we've talked about city government, local nonprofits, funders, et cetera. This really is a story of trying to get those key stakeholders which live in that region where these efforts are happening to really participate and to really see themselves offering positive contributions as we move forward on this new vision of water stewardship and redevelopment in the Inner Harbor. Again, one of the things that I would be hopeful for just in terms of our listeners is taking away some how-tos. I know that We're relatively unique here in Milwaukee in terms of the organizations that we have, like both of yours on this podcast today, but also our experience and expertise in previous redevelopments. But I think there are some lessons here, both in terms of, number one, aligning with existing efforts that are already underway in terms of of water stewardship, water restoration, et cetera. Leveraging investments that have already been made, you know, in the community or their promise to be made in that community and bringing some complementary efforts to those. And then for me, really the importance of bringing in the private sector and and private landowners to participate in water stewardship, because the wallop that we talked about, you know, it's water and that land connection and sort of that integrated approach to stewarding both of those resources because of how they impact each other. So just from your two perspectives, again, just looking at this sort of vast array of topics that we covered today. Any sort of concluding thoughts or points? And and I'll start with you, Lilith, and then turn it over to you, Vicki. I think one thing about the Harbor District is it's particularly obvious to what an extent the water is both an asset and a challenge or a, a source of potential risk, right? But obviously, every community has water as both an asset and a possible risk. So other communities may have to look harder to define it. You know, it really served itself up for me, but it's always there and it's always there as a connection point. So we have really found that going to businesses, going to the businesses in our district and just laying out what we're looking at, how we see the place, what the issues are, that people are so responsive to that. And, you know, as Vicki said, being on a great lake, you, of course, have this connection to it. So that gives us a little foot in the door, I suppose. But it is really such a commonality among every city, every business, every community to have these same issues and need to figure out how we're going to deal with them in a way that protects that resource going forward. So just as an organizing principle, I think for community organizing as a way to get doors open, I think it's a great tool to leverage. And then beyond that, finding those partners who are able to work with us and 
use what we can offer to their best ends has been so productive. And the Alliance for Water Stewardship was a great example of that. We're a very small organization. We have a full-time staff of four people. So we're not making up new certification programs, right? We're going to continue to find the people who can bring benefits to our stakeholders in the district and figure out how to connect those things up in ways that have long-term benefits. You've described in the Alliance for Water Stewardship terms what we referred to as shared challenges and shared opportunities, and we can only address those issues together as water stakeholders. Thanks a lot. Vicki, final thoughts? Absolutely. So one thing I think is really attractive about the Alliance for Water Stewardship standard is this idea of continual improvement. So we didn't get much into that in our conversation, but the way the standard works, it's a process standard that's developed with water stakeholders in the catchment area. And those stakeholders help the site develop the plan. And then over the years, they're continually involved. And in order to get recertified, the site has to adopt a more aggressive standard. And that may sound like a heavy lift or a challenge for a lot of businesses. But I think one thing to remember is you can always start somewhere. People want to do better. Nobody says that they want to do worse. They want to pollute the water more. And in some instances, there are very low cost things people can do or even things that can save you money that will also improve water quality, like using less salt on your sidewalk or parking lot. You may not know exactly how to do that, but I think the standard connects you with the people that can help you figure out how much salt do I really need to put on my driveway? And one thing I've heard from the businesses that have gone through this process is they've so enjoyed meeting all the stakeholders, getting to know them, knowing that they can rely on them as a resource as they continue to improve practices. So it's something to be embraced and not to be intimidated by. And I'm very curious to see how the sites that have gone through this process will use their certification as a benefit publicly for them. That's a great point, you know, and, and one of the the key drivers in terms of outcomes for the AWS standard is really to get those sites, those factories, those farms. Yeah, we want you to focus internally within your four walls, within your fence line on how you're using water, but we really want you to cast your gaze outside the fence line into that broader watershed and really start making meaningful connections with stakeholders. We all live, all three of us, everybody listening lives in a neighborhood and there's always that building or that business you've never been in or you've seen. You're always kind of curious what's going on there. That's been one of the best stories from working with AWS is finally some of those key stakeholders get to find out what was happening in that building. And oh, they're doing all this great stuff on water stewardship. And now we know we've got a connection. We're all part of this community and this effort, particularly as it relates to the Inner Harbor. So that was our water session for today, talking about creating a water stewardship district. We again want to thank Vicki Elkin from the Fund for Lake Michigan and Lilith Fowler from the Harbor District for joining me this afternoon. It's truly a pleasure, two of uh, the Great Lakes leaders on water issues and redevelopment. So thank you both for being here. Thanks for joining us today. Special thanks to our series sponsor, Rex Nord. Additional support is provided by the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, along with the Fund for Lake Michigan, SCS Global, and Qualified Water System. Don't miss a beat. Subscribe to Water Sessions today.